This podcast contains mature subject matter and is intended for entertainment purposes only. Viewer discretion is advised. Christine Weller, 13. Colleen Dagnalt, 13. Darren Johnsrud, 16. Sander Wolfsteiner, 16. Ada Court, 13. Simon Parrington, 9. Judy Cosma, 14. Raymond King, 15. Sigrun Arnd, 18. Terry Lynn Carson, 15. Louise Chartrand, 17 years old. This podcast is dedicated to the victims of Clifford Olson. Hey, I'm beautifully ridiculous. Yeah, I'm such a happy mess. La da dee da. So I'm beautifully ridiculous and perfect, no less. La da dee da. La da 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 dee da. La 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 dee dee da. Hello, friend. I'm so happy you're here with me. My name is Katie Campbell, and I am your hostess with the mostest. Welcome to the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. Why beautifully ridiculous? Because I am most indeed beautiful, smart, talented, and also utterly ridiculous. I know this about myself, so I wrote and performed my own theme song. I just didn't know at the time that I recorded that theme song, just what it would eventually be used for. Now let's go meet my first guest, Tom. We're here. There we go. Okay, Kate. Just Thank you so much for having me and giving me your time. I really appreciate it. The only reason I'm doing this, because a friend of mine contacted me, mm-hmm. and way back we did a lot of social things together with his family. You sure and, did. Uh, That's George is here too. Did, and we were all kind of the same, suddenly we had the same virtual Leo views on different politics and all that kind of stuff. But basic things like respect for other people were all, so he's the man. but. You have to think of when it all happened. It was in an era era where people cared for their neighbor. Yes. And you know, now they won't talk to their neighbor. I I mean, it's just, or they're mad at their neighbor because the cars park somewhere. They have all those issues where that group of people try to coexist with what was in the neighborhood and what they were doing and then participate. So so all those things as far as the society has gone. Yes. We're in a me generation type thing and uh, and if it can't be them, it can't be them, uh, then they want to discredit the other things so they somehow can fit in. It's uh, I think a very difficult society for people like young ladies like you. Yeah. Well, it was an interesting turn of events uh, meeting up with you, Tom, with through our friend George. Uh, and George is the one who informed me that you had basically your whole career in corrections. So, what do you want to tell us about that? When did you start? I think on our first phone call you said nineteen sixty-six or something. In, uh, Whoa, there, Tiger! Back up. How in the hell did I find myself in Tom's living room? It's a long story, and I won't bore you with all of the details, but Tom is 86, with bright blue eyes and a long, sharp nose, and he's still very tall and lanky, with soft white hair, worn very short, and kind of reminiscent of a Clint Eastwood haircut. Tom and I share a mutual friend in George. George is 76 and very dear to my heart. I met George when I was employed at a church, and we bonded over our shared loves of music, animals, philosophy, deep discussions of spirituality, and the meaning of life. I accompany him to the symphony, and he's helping me get over my fear of horses by training me to ride his horse chai, and you can follow more of our shenanigans on TikTok. I relayed to George my idea for a novel that I'm working on, and he in turn has supported my endeavor by editing my work. Always up for a tea and a chat, George sat in my living room one day as I prattled on about interviewing this woman for my book. And her, she ended up being incarcerated in various correctional facilities in and around Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And George bowed his head, and I knew he had something really important to say. So I leaned in, and George said, you need to speak to my friend Tom. So naturally, my reaction was, who the hell is Tom, and why would I need to speak to him? And George said, oh... Tom's been my friend for 40 years, and he spent his 
career in corrections, and I think when he retired, he may have been the warden. Needless to say, my interest was totally piqued. So, after many phone calls, emails, and coordinating calendars, George and I set off from central Vancouver Island, where we both live, to the Lower Mainland. So, it took nearly five hours for George and I to travel by highway and ferry boat, and then more highways, to get to the Lower Mainland, colloquially known as Vancouver. It's actually comprised of several large municipalities, seemingly all rolled into one, and is now home to over four million people. I interviewed Tom on January 3rd, 2023, but before the interview even began, I was absolutely gobsmacked. Here, George and I stood in Tom and Pat's foyer, shaking hands, and I had this uncanny sense of deja vu. But I couldn't put my finger on it until moments later when I walked up the five stairs from the foyer into the living room and my heart skipped a beat. It was so pronounced, I like clutched my chest and my heart was just pounding and I I couldn't breathe. And George noticed, he was like, what is going on? I was standing in my childhood home. Not exactly. I was in Maple Ridge and my childhood home is in Victoria in the West Shore, but It was as if I was back on Vancouver Island. Now, to some, this may not seem unusual because many homes are really similar and have similar designs and layouts, but this is not an ordinary house. This is a four-level split with a sunken living room, two sunken, you know, living room and and a den, vaulted ceilings, tongue and groove cedar, uh, banisters all over the place, this amazing staircase, double fireplaces. Like, it's just, you know, five bedrooms, four bathrooms. Uh, I just... When I say I was gobsmacked, I I felt like I had been run over by a freight train. I was like, <gasps> what? The house, including the carpet, was virtually identical to the house I grew up in. It was just a mirrored image. And I grew up in that house from 10 years old to 19. That house has virtually all of my formative memories. And I instantly just felt like, oh, wow another piece of the puzzle. It was bizarre. It was uncanny. It was synchronistic. It was crazy. We sat down. The Christmas tree was still twinkling in the corner. And Tom told me his story. I started my employment with the Attorney General's Department on February the 23rd, 1959. 1959. You remember the exact day. Okay. Well, it it was a big meme for me because uh, I'd... uh, just shortly before that, uh, decided with Pat that we would get married. Right. And uh, I had no employment, Mm -hmm. and I sat down with Pat's father. He wanted to talk to me and uh, went over the relationship and all that kind of stuff. And so him and his wife, Annie, uh, they said, well, how can you support our daughter? Fair and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to get a job. So her father said to me, what are you doing on Saturday? This was Wednesday. I said, nothing. I had no work. He said, could you drop by? He said, I, I, I want you to meet somebody. Mm-hmm. So I did. I came by the farm, and uh, he had some people there, and uh, talked to him for a while. And his friend, a farming friend by the name of Erskine, his oldest boy, had just recently got a new job. Oh, okay. Working at this new jail they'd built in Maple Ridge up on 248th Street. Right. And uh, so her father was trying to get me to get employed. That's what the whole thing. So I talked to the guy, and the guy said, look... I went up there, and there was a guy by the name of Dave Barrett, who became their premier of British Columbia years later. He was the personnel officer, and he was just our poly. I was right wing, and he was left wing type thing. But uh, we talked about things, and uh, and he started. We had an interview, and he was there with two other people. Well, I made them laugh. I was talking about, they wanted to know how I would get along with people. And one of my answers, well, I said, when we get together as a group, the uh, the guys, you know, all, still talk to me the next day. Like I'm not chasing after their women and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. For some reason, that really struck a funny and they laughed and all that kind of stuff. So 
little things like that, talking to the uh, Dave Barrett, struck all kinds of, uh, what do you call it, honest, uh, uh, how you'd explain your own self. Anyhow, so they hired me, and, uh, and I had two opportunities, and one is to become uh, a correctional guard. Right. And you dress in the brown uniform and all that kind of stuff. And the other one was called program. And the program was people who would work closer with the inmates. There's 400 guys there. And uh, maybe try to get a report or find out why they're in jail. Right. And, all that. and that fitted me like a tea. Because I'm a talker anyhow. Right. I can talk to guys even when some were trying to do bad things, you know. So, And as a result of that kind of thing, I went from being a guard, and I just, you know, next thing, I, I, you know, a few years later, I was the warden. So. Wow. So in 1959, how old were you? Pardon me? In 1959, how old were you when you got well, the job? Well, 59, 59, I'd have been 20, what's that piece, 27? 23, 24. 20, <laughs> There's 23, Pat. 24, yeah. And your wife of how many years, how long have the two of you been married? We've been married? Yeah, how long have you been married to Pat? Oh, what is it, 30, 34 years? Oh. Longer than that. Our, ki our kids are in their 60s. <laughs> <laughs> we, we never get any older. This year. 65 years married? 65. Oh, yeah. Six, five. oh yes, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I've only been married to my husband for about 22. So, like, my hat's off to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Why is that important? I just want to know. Oh, okay. No. I know you're getting a background on me. And yeah, I just, just a bit wondering. of a background. Just, um... Yeah. It's fascinating the way, because we talked about this on the phone at one point, about how <clears throat> nowadays you need some sort of psychological degree or something like that in order to sort of get into corrections or a degree in criminology. They want that sort of background. But in your day when you started, that wasn't the case. You just went down and got a job at a new facility called Haney Institute. That's correct? Yeah, Haney Correctional. Haney Correctional. Yeah. And HCI, yeah. HC, oh, is that what they called it? Was yeah, HCI? Yeah, uh, uh, the inmates ruled all the land. It was HCI. You know, oh, that okay. was the mailing address. And it opened in what year in British Columbia? Maple Ridge, British Columbia, Haney Correctional Institute opened in. Yeah, I started 58. It opened up in. Uh, where are we at? 58. 57, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, I'm just trying to think because it was open, it was open just a year before I got a job okay. there, mm -hmm. there, and uh, it was uh, what can I call it? It was a new phase of uh, being in jail, right? And uh, other than that, they had uh, you know 400 guys and 50. Uh, Occupancy in each pad. Right. And they had all those things, but the inmates had a choice type thing. And when they come in, there was one area for 50 people where the bars closed automatically or whatever, and the people who were in jail uh, would go in there, and at certain times they'd lock them in and then open up at 8 o'clock, and then there was another type that had a, a cubicle, so there was plywood cubicles, no door, just out into a big, large area which held 50 inmates. Right. And then, so they had different types of residencies, and the inmates would be able to move depending upon their ability to change, get involved, and going to risk. more and more and more of an open setting. Okay. And so I was running one of these open settings. And uh, and it was a cubicle type of thing, 50 inmates in there. And I'd just been promoted. And uh, they called them sergeants in those days. Okay. And then they got to be called case workers and all that. But anyhow, so... 
it wasn't long that I I started thinking the way it was set up that uh, oh, all the units had steel gates and when the people went in there was a big they had a Gibbons key I mean it was just unreal I carried in my best dress pants for about a month and ripped them all up oh my gosh. but but that's all gone now everything's coded and uh, you know everything yeah. they can open wings and doors but and when you all started you had a big heavy key that had to open different yeah. things like a and that's what key. I did for the first about a month and a half uh, okay and the inmates called me a key jockey a key jockey. Yeah. Okay. Where's that key jockey? You know, and I was there and I'd open them up to let them go to work in the dining room. And there was a automotive shop there and a diesel shop and they had all these training facilities. And we, different corridors all in and they would assign different staff, me, to a certain, and I had a set of keys like that. And they were called a Gibbons key. And I would say a key would probably weigh close to a pound. Wow. They were a big, huge, handmade key. Like six to eight inches yeah, long. And there, were, and there were designs, so no matter how smart. And we had inmates come in there, and they would look and draw pictures of the guard when he opened the door and try to fashion a key and we found from time to time different people who were very uh, studious, not the boyish type like a lot, most right. them, but these guys, and they would take a, a look at this thing and draw a picture, draw a picture. And next thing, maybe with after maybe a, a year or more of a group, they would get together and combine knowledge and you're messing this and look and go and so maybe after six months or a year they started to develop a key crazy yeah and they started developing a key and they made it you know out of cardboard traced traced and then they went from that into a piece of wood they got from the woodwork shop which they shouldn't have had. Right. And then went and they went on and on. Then they got a piece of fine sheet metal. And they traced on, they made the key and uh, and then the, the inmates at different times, especially in their shops, the the staff would say uh, they were doing something, they'd say, Here, open that door and the inmate go and you open and bring the key back. So they got a chance many times to compare the key they were making to with the what? actual Gibbons key that was made in Britain by hand. Wow. And were they successful, these men? At they were successful. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The thing is, the material wasn't strong enough lots of time, to and turn. it would bend. And oh. so they put layer on layer and riveted them together, the metal. But uh, it worked sometimes, but not all the time. So uh, anyhow, as we would have it, the best way to operate, you for me, you always had to have, which I call an ace in the hole, you had to have somebody, an inmate, in the thing who would... Oh, to give you inf like a, he uh, information. He would give me information. Yes. And as a result of that, I'd work with him, with his family, job status, what was going on, and enhance his movement on. So, you so had instead an of doing four years, hmm, I might be able to get him out there in about 12 months. Wow, yeah. That's my ability to manipulate the system. Sure. You know? And if you can get a guy with the inmates called a fink. Right, yes, I've heard that word, a fink. was a guy they hated. And if they knew who the fink was, He'd be stabbed or beaten badly, you know. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you've seen a few things over the years. But for a guy to try and get out early, he'd risk that, you know. If he's doing four years, and he could get out in less than six months. Well, now, because it was, it's a maximum security carrot. prison, right? Haney's a maximum security prison, is it not? What is the, the status of Haney? Well, that was classified 
uh, as a medium jail. Oh, as and a medium. I don't know what the hell to mean by that. Okay. Because we had a guys in there like uh, like Clifford Olson. You did have Clifford Olson. I'd wonder yeah, if I you know, had... Seven, 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 six was his number. Wow, you remember his number. Shoot. Oh, man. That guy was... Uh, he was a murderer. Yes, of children. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm aware. I don't know how many... He specialized in boys. Yeah. If you do not know, Clifford Olson is an infamous and notorious child serial killer in British Columbia. I did some cursory research trying to figure out and track down um, what happened to Clifford Olson, um, trying to verify Tom's recollections. I wasn't really able to find anything. Let me read for you an excerpt from the Globe and Mail, an article by Sandra Martin published September 30th, 2011. It does state that Clifford Olson, once he was uh, convicted in October of 1982, he was sent east from British Columbia. He was sent east somewhere in Canada to federal penitentiaries, maximum security. So I think what Tom is most likely talking about, because if you remember, Clifford Olson started his life of crime at 17 by being locked up for a and e a break and enter. So what most likely happened, what I can deduce perhaps, is that uh, Clifford Olson ran into Tom at Haney Correctional Institute prior to his murderous spree. So he was in and out and incarcerated from the time he was 17. Uh, so he most likely met Tom along that route before he was a murderer. Either way, Tom has met Clifford Olson, and there's not too many people who can say that. Um, I don't know who, who would want to. I, I don't know. Um, it certainly makes for a very entertaining story. And he taunted the families too. I think that was the issue, is that he taunted them from jail. He, he was would phone the rude. family. Yeah. In January of 1982, he initially pled not guilty to several counts of murder. And then three days later, on January 14th, 1982, he finally changed his plea to guilty of 11 counts of first-degree murder. I'm going to read from you an excerpt from The Globe and Mail. It's an article by Sandra Martin, published on September 30th, 2011, and it details the life and times of Clifford Olson. Clifford Olson was born January 1st, 1940. He lived in uh, Vancouver. Here is an excerpt from the article. Olson frequently played hooky and dropped out of school after completing grade 8. He lived with his parents until he was sent to jail for break and enter when he was 17. Over the next quarter century, he spent all but four years behind bars, racking up more than 90 convictions and seven escapes from custody. A con artist with a charming but manipulative manner, Olson sometimes got early release for good behavior, and other times he had his sentence extended after escape attempts. Few trusted him for long, and eventually he antagonized both guards and fellow prisoners. He eventually got married, but just before he got married, he had already killed three of his victims. He was arrested on August 12, 1981 near Port Alberni on Vancouver Island. I live about an hour and 20 minutes from Port Alberni. Uh, he was arrested for suspicion of abduction by two female hitchhikers in his car. He was, at that time, 41 years old and a habitual criminal. The bodies of the three boys and eight girls, aged between 9 and 18, had been found in secluded areas within a 90-kilometer radius of Vancouver. Some of the victims had been raped and sodomized, some were bludgeoned, others were stabbed, and one was strangled. All had been drugged and killed in a murderous spree lasting only nine months, from November 1980 through July 1981, while Olson was out of prison on mandatory supervision. I love how he was still able to commit 11 acts of heinous murder against children while he was, quote, out on supervision. Mandatory supervision, my fucking ass. Back to the article. Finding the rest of the victims and extracting a confession out of Olson became the urgent preoccupation for police, caught between trying to bring a murderer to justice without any concrete evidence and assaging the horror of the families desperate to know what had happened to their children and to reclaim what remained of their brutalized bodies. That was the rationale behind the cash for bodies deal. 
that was only revealed after Olson was sentenced in January 1982. The police had agreed to pay Olson $30,000 for evidence on the four bodies they had recovered before his arrest in August 1981, with an additional $10,000 for each subsequent murder site he identified or body he helped locate. Olson was so chuffed about the arrangement that he provided details about one murder free of charge, quote-unquote, a freebie, as he liked to boast. The article continues, Before Olson gave up any gory details, however, he had insisted that the money was paid to his wife, Joan, who had moved with their baby son to her parents' home in the Kitsilano area of Vancouver. She had played the devoted trusting wife during his trial. That all changed when she was called as a witness in a lawsuit brought by the families of seven of the victims. He killed 11, or was convicted of killing 11. The group sued in the Supreme Court of BC in October 1984 to have the $100,000 Cash for Bodies Trust Fund declared fraudulent and the remaining money given to them as compensation for the murder of their children. The BC Court of Appeal unanimously ruled against the families in March 1986, arguing that the RCMP payment was not made as compensation for the deaths of the children. Rather, it was, quote, authorized to obtain evidence to convict Olson of the murders. The Supreme Court of Canada refused to hear the case on appeal later that same year. This is where the Globe and Mail article talks about Clifford Olson being in a penitentiary. Quote, Olson was sent more than halfway across the country after his murder trial and incarcerated in Kingston Penitentiary in February 1982. He spent 23 hours a day in his cell in a special administrative segregation unit in E-Block, housing inmates who need protection from fellow prisoners. In his first seven years, he made five requests for a transfer and wrangled a trip back to Vancouver after duping police with tales about his complicity in unsolved crimes. After visiting the cell block in August 1989, Globe and Mail Justice reporter Kirk Macon described Olson as fit and tanned and as unrepentant as he was notorious. True to form, he instantly spat out demands and cunningly worded entreaties. Leaping back and forth from his cot to his desk, shoved, he shoved letters, writs, and court documents through the bars. The only time that Olson turned away from his obsessive interest in religion and mounting legal challenges, according to Macon, was the hour a day he spent running in the exercise yard. Two years later, E-Block had been shut down and Olson had been moved to H-Block. Even there, he was placed as far away from others as possible and put into a specially reinforced cell with floor-to-ceiling plexiglass covering the bars. Oh my God, it's like Hannibal Lecter. Even his isolation couldn't muffle the incessant sounds of his typing as he wrote pornographic and sadistic memoirs of his crimes. He produced legal challenges and, before authorities started screening his mail, composed revoltingly explicit and threatening letters to some of the families of his victims. In 1992, after complaining about back pain, Olson was sent for x-rays to a Kingston hospital. Technicians found a handcuffs key stolen from prison guards tucked up into his rectum. That escape attempt thwarted, Olson was transferred after almost a decade of fractious behavior in Kingston to the special handling unit in the maximum security federal penitentiary in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. And so it continued, with Olson using the system to apply repeatedly for parole, privileges, and satisfaction under the charter for what he deemed were the cruel and unusual conditions of his incarceration. When the Saskatchewan facility closed down in the summer of 1997, Olson was transferred back east to the Super Maximum Security Special Handling Unit in St. Anne de Plaine, north of Montreal in Quebec. The article continues. I do not have the words to adequately describe the enormity of your crimes or to describe the heartbreak and anguish you have caused, Mr. Justice H. C. McKay declared as the mother of one of the victims sobbed in the packed courtroom, after saying that there is no punishment that a civilized country can impose that would be adequate. The judge gave Olson 11 concurrent life sentences and recommended that he never be released. You'd think that might have been the last anybody heard of Olson, a.k.a. the Beast of B.C. He gave himself that moniker? Nobody else did. Just grandiosity at its finest. 
In fact, his diabolical antics continued for the rest of his life, beginning with the infamous Cash for Bodies deal he struck with the RCMP in B.C., with the approval of then-Federal Solicitor General Robert Kaplan. Olson played the criminal justice system like a personal video game for the next three decades. He toyed with police and tabloid journalists, promising them details on unsolved crimes in return for privileges and media coverage. He submitted poems and stories to literary contests to the horror of organizers, and he used his manipulative, narcissistic personality and his quasi-knowledge of the law to taunt lawyers and the families of his victim. He appealed for a new trial and early parole under faint hope clauses, petitioned for parole on all but one opportunity after he had served 25 years behind bars, and used the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to mount dozens of frivolous and vexatious challenges. In two of his more bizarre legal submissions, he claimed he claimed variously that being denied a, quote, solid pleasure life-sized revolutionary not inflated sex doll, quote, and the installation of plexiglass to line the front of his cell to protect him from other inmates amounted to cruel and unusual punishment and thereby contravened the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada. The article continues. Such a well-written article, Sandra Martin. Olson never showed any remorse for his heinous murders, but the criminal justice system itself changed in response to his diabolical behavior on both sides of prison walls. His crimes gave rise to the victims of violence movement, their representation at trials and parole hearings, and the establishment of a missing children's registry. His incessant demands for parole led to an amendment of the criminal code, barring multiple murderers from applying for early parole under the Faint Hope Clause, and his ability to collect pension and old age income supplements resulted in the passage of Bill C-31, denying such payments to prisoners while they are incarcerated. Clifford Olson died of cancer on Friday, September 30th, 2011. He is not missed. Yeah. Besides sexually and all that stuff. But the thing is, the way he killed them. And he taunted the families too. I think that was the issue, is that he taunted them from jail. He, he would phone the family. Yeah. And, you know, and the system then was to give these people a phone call. You know, and when he got his thing phoned, I don't know how he got the numbers, but he would phone the parents up and say, and you know, I'm them. Clifford Dawes, I killed your son. You know what I did? I took a nail and he and the the, the mother or father would be just oh. uh, all that would come back. Of you know, they're sixty year old or whatever we can and then they they'd have to live that. But we could not uh, as a system take that privilege away from that guy. He had to have the ability to communicate. That was the psychologists and all the people who were right. involved. It's interesting that somehow he was also able to gather their personal phone numbers. Like, that's where it's kind of like, did he have access, I guess, to a phone book? Would they be in the phone book? Was everybody in the phone book at that time? Uh, I don't know. Well, when I started in, that was, uh, I talked to different people. And when I got into a group sessions, the first thing I'd tell them, guys, because one guy one time says to me, hey, Mr. Thompson, we'll find out where you live. We'll, we'll, you know, and one day you're going to come there and I'll be there. And I said, well, when you do come, I just want to tell you, I've got a, a 12 gauge on the side of the bed. I said, it's not loaded, but right by my bed there. And I did have that because some guys would tell me how we were going to kill my wife. And, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I, I don't know how they found out, but there are people in records, they find out names and numbers and addresses. And Well, I'm, as, I'm assuming that when they're locked up, they don't have a lot of stimulus necessarily, so they've got a yeah. one-track mind, whereas yeah. you have all the responsibilities of a free person, yeah. you know, so you don't have the time to sit there and plot, whereas someone else might. Yeah. So, yeah. The thing you find out after you deal with people over a, a period of time, that everybody's different. Yes. You and I are different, George. Yes. We're all different people. We may have certain things we agree upon. But we're all different. And I think that's one of the big things for staff in there, 
they wanted to uh, maintain through authority who they were and everything else. Never mind names, you're never gonna know where I live and all that kind of stuff. And I was in there with the dead thing. Look, why lie to these guys? You know, if they want, they're gonna find out. They have people out there. That, and so, at some point, they're gonna get out and sort of live within the outlying community. So there's, there's all possibility that you could be in a grocery store and see one at some point when they got out. Like, it's just, yeah. it's there. The yeah. possibility's there. Yeah. Next time on the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. You took risks. That's the only word. And a lot of staff would not do that. Special thank you to Sandra Martin from the Globe and Mail for her wonderful article on Clifford Olson. Thanks for stopping by, friend. We'll see you next time on the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. Hey, I'm beautifully